Long days, pleasant nights, and welcome to Kingslingers, a doof media podcast journeying through Stephen King's Dark Tower series and beyond. I am your host and constant reader, Scott Daly, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host. They might have broken his leg, but they never broke his spirit? It's Matt Freeman. Oh, 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 oh yeah. Gopher? Uh, no. No, thank you. More for me. No. <laughs> This week, we are finishing Stephen King's The Stand, chatting about chapters 74 through the epilogue of the book. With the help of Tom, Stu returns back to the Boulder Free Zone, where our characters decide what kind of life they want to live now and what kind of world it is going to be. Matt, what did you think of the ending of this book? You know, it was... It was- it's great. It's a great denouement. <laughs> you know, there's usually – it's funny. People – I think other people commented this, so I'm sort of riffing on what they said. But, um, you know, an unusually good denouement for a book, an unusually good ending, right? Usually you kind of feel like once the action lands – or often, anyway. So often you feel like once the action is kind of over, you're like, okay, you know, I'm done. But but this is – you know, it's a nice kind of meaty – um epilogue denouement ending whatever word you want to use to, for mm-hmm. for the the culmination and sort of wrapping everything up and making you and, and there's kind of a little adventure in here too right it's not just like and then this is what happened it's it's like there sure. this is like sort of its own little thing which which has its own little elements worth talking about because i think one beat we're going to hit over and over again this week is the idea that the future is still uncertain and and there is this streak of destructiveness in human nature that will always be there and uh uh, that that's kind of a thread that goes through the entire um the entire reading actually yeah and i think there's a lot to talk about there actually because i think kind of getting to the bottom of what we think this book is saying about that and and what the book actually thinks the future will hold if it is making any kind of definitive statement or not i think it's worth talking about yeah, I'll get my Lord of the Rings comparison out of the way up front, um, <laughs> w- which is simply that, you know, after the main action of the Lord of the Rings is is over in the books, the hobbits go back to the Shire and the Shire has been taken over by Saruman. And there's this whole there's there's this whole extra, you know, basically story. It's like mm-hmm. the, and, and and that has its own thematic punch where it's basically saying just because you defeated the great evil doesn't mean you've defeated evil. Like it doesn't yeah. mean it doesn't mean that you've won forever and always, and there's no more struggle. And that's, I think actually a fairly similar message to what we're getting here. No, I think you're totally right. All right, Matt. Uh, well, we will get into it here in a sec. Before we do that though, we just have a couple quick announcements. Uh, the first is we're going to continue to plug our other podcasts because there's way more people that listen to this one than that one. And we want you to check out other stuff. So, just a reminder that on our other show called The Doofcast, last week we covered uh, The Rings of Power, a show that Matt and I both quite liked, but uh, apparently not the general consensus based on the comments we got on our episode. It's at least Shockingly. a controversial opinion. Yeah, there's yeah. It, it, well, it's interesting because a lot of people really like it and a lot of people really don't like it. And that's mm-hmm. that's unusual, right? Like usually it's, it kind of breaks cleanly one way or the other or people are just kind of in the middle. This is yeah. one of the rare instances where people feel strongly in both directions. True. Very true. Um, and then this week's episode is going to be on um, Ridley Scott's Robin Hood. Uh, I can't wait to talk to, to you about that movie, <laughs> Matt. Um, I guess. I, guess I have not watched it. Yeah. I have not watched it yet for the episode. So I'm still basing it off of the t- one time I watched it 15 years ago and, and didn't have a lot of nice things to say about it then. But we'll see. We'll yeah, see. it might be that thing that keeps happening where we keep revisiting Ridley Scott movies that we haven't seen in 15 years and then realizing they're much better than we remember them being. It could be, but I, I'd i have my doubts <laughs> when it comes to this movie. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay. So make sure you uh, look up our other podcast feed. Uh, you can find it on the same website you find this one, or you can just go into your podcatcher and type Doofcast, and you'll see all those. Like, Jesus, Matt, we're about to hit episode 200 of this particular variation of the show <laughs> so we've got hundreds of episodes we should yeah. say something in there for everybody speaking of which um this friday we are doing the book club which is a monthly feature over there on the Doofcast, and we are covering uh watership down which mm-hmm. is very pertinent to this show 
uh, because of course it is heavily referenced in the stand and as now i have completely read watership down i can say not only is it just referenced but i feel like the plot is pretty it's pretty similar actually <laughs> in a lot of ways um not not I, I not, not beat for beat like it's not like uh, it's not like stephen king was like i'm gonna do watership down but with humans um <laughs> but there are there are a lot of plot movements that feel similar. And so I, I kind of, I think he was doing more than just a, a nod of the head. I think, I think he, I think he really took a lot from uh, Watership Down actually for, for the stand specifically. I think you are correct. And I think we will have lots to say about that and more this Friday when we meet up for a book club. So if you don't follow us on YouTube, please subscribe to our YouTube channel because that is where we will stream that conversation live Friday at 930 Central Time. Um, so join us. Come chat with us about Watership Down where That's I'm right. excited. I'm really excited. Oh, I sure am. Yeah. OK, Matt, let's get into it. First, we have chapter 40. Sorry, 74, the first chapter of our reading this week. Um, and this chapter brings us back with with poor old broken legged Stu, uh, the only living member of our Las Vegas Rat Pack. Stu is sick, uh, has a fever. He's got pneumonia, maybe maybe some sort of flu as well. Um, I, I think I think the wonderful great irony of this is that that after all this, after surviving all this, it's it's Captain Tripp's less deadly cousin that might take out our hero here yeah um i think there is something ironic poetic being said with that mm -hmm. i guess the question i have for you and, and i think i think it's it's worth stating it here at the beginning but i think it carries through most of the denouement of this book where were you confident going into this week's reading were you confident going through these chapters that Stu was going to indeed live and make it back to boulder the entire time or were you a little bit uncertain because i know like we kind of like every time i had to say it yesterday last week it was like you know all these other people have dead and now Stu, the one who broke his leg and seemed doomed has has was the one that lived and then i had to say at least so far. Um, but but did you ever buy that at least so far? How how confident were you that Stu was going to make it? I mean, I think I was probably 90% confident that he was going to make it back to Boulder. King was trying pretty hard to make us feel uncertain about that, though. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, throughout this reading, he, he keeps getting closer and closer to death. And you could see it happening the other way. You could see him dying and Tom kind of just bringing the message home. Um, I think there there were other things, though, that made me feel more certain that he was going to make it. Like when he started getting the dreams about Franny's baby, I felt increasingly sure that he was going to make it back to see the baby and, and find out one way or the other what was going to happen with the baby. So mm. so ultimately, though, you know, I, I guess I guess there was some amount of tension over over the question of are they going to make it back? But um to me, yet again, this is an example of, of like, I care more about watching how all of this unfolds than I do about the absolute answer of does he live or not? Sure. I mean, I think it does kind of help carry you through the scenes, the, the level of tension there is there. But yeah, I, I mean, I distinctly kind of remember, I, I just, I think there's something about this part of the book when you've made it to this far, it would be a little bit weird if it was like, uh actually Stu just died or up uh, you know tom showed up and was there to save him but oh the fever was too it was too much the pneumonia was too bad and the antibiotics didn't take in time that would just feel yeah. weird it would it would play really weird with our whole like you know religious conversation where it's like god asked for the sacrifice of of larry and ralph and glenn oh and then also Stu broke his leg and died separately in an unrelated <laughs> yeah. incident it's like well yeah. Okay, so so was Stu a sacrifice, or was that just a thing that happened? I don't know. I mean, I already don't quite exactly know what to make of the whole picture in general, but that would be even weirder and more confusing. Well, I think we're going to have some things to say about that for sure. Yes. Um, we do get a moment where Stu kind of gets to the point where he's certainly sure that he's going to die. And so he writes a note for Franny. He leaves it in Kojak's collar and kind of says, when I go, Kojak, you make sure you get home and deliver this note. Um, but fortunately, he, that never actually has to happen. Um, 
we do get this moment where Stu wakes up with a start after feeling what he thinks is an earthquake. And we see arduously and, and with great difficulty, he manages to climb to the top of the culvert he's stuck in and sees what's producing this shaking and this, all this heat. Of course, we know what it is, Matt. It is the mushroom cloud over Vegas. And so he, he sees that and then kind of knows in this moment that, that all his friends are, are gone. Mm-hmm. But that and they then, won. Yeah, that, that they won, that they're, they're going to be safe now. Um, of course, he doesn't know how it all unfolded, which is, I guess, strikes me as, you know, a, a little bit of a pang of, of tragedy is he knows that they won, but nobody actually knows how they won or, or what their final stand was like and how they met it bravely and all that. They just know that they won. Um, yeah, sure. I, I don't know. I, I think you're right that there is a, a little bit of tragedy there, but I kind of I don't know. I kind of like that that is a thing that Larry only Larry will know about himself for sure. You know? Yeah. That's a, a good point. I like that. I like that, that, that phrasing you've changed my mind. Um, <laughs> and I, I also think it's, it's in some sense clever that we set up this idea that Tom is being guided by Nick, because if we didn't know that, then we might be like, wait a minute, then how did, how did Tom survive if he's still like significantly closer to the explosion? And I think, it's just, it's just like, yeah, Nick just told him to take shelter in a crevasse for a minute and then he was fine. It was all yeah, over. Just climb into a fridge. You're yeah. safe in there. Just climb, yeah, exactly. There was probably a fridge. God probably placed a fridge right there. There's a fridge delivery truck on its way to, to <laughs> Vegas. Um, Incredible. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I really love this bit, Matt, uh, where we kind of very briefly jump into the mind of Kojak here. It says, Kojak whined uneasily. The man was sick. He could smell the sickness and mingling with that smell was a new one, a black one. It was the smell the rabbits had on them when he pounced, the smell that had been on the wolf he had disemboweled on their brother Abigail's house in Hemingford home. The smell had been on the towns he had passed through on his way to Boulder and Glen Bateman. It was the smell of death. So I, I just love this way of like, you know, they could have just said, oh, he's dying. Stu's going to die. But but the, by this doing this quick jump into Kojak, I feel like it it, it allows this moment to really land a lot more. That the, Stu is not just sick. Stu is actively dying and he's going to die unless something mm. happens. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, r- right. I mean, I think I expected Tom to show up. And so I, I was like, well, we're setting up the idea that Tom's going to show up. But yes, mm-hmm. the... the the idea is definitely that that Stu is is quite fatally sick and definitely not not going to pull out of this just because the dog is bringing him some some food. I mean that that's I think we're going to talk about this more later. But God really pulls out all the stops for Stu, right? He, he pulled he basically yeah. ha- has the dog come along almost like specifically so that the dog can then stay and hang back with Stu and bring Stu food. Um, and then has Tom come by and, and do the, and, you know, do the rest of the, the, the work. Um, so, so, so yeah. why is the question yeah, I, mean, I guess we're going to talk about big, later. That's the big question. Yeah. I think that's the question we're going to attempt to, to try to answer here. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I, I do also just love the idea, like the, the black smell in here inside the idea of death being this black smell. It is very reminiscent of you know, Randall Flagg himself. And I think one of, one of the things that I, I just want to say about this whole denouement, uh, you know, as a whole is even outside of the epilogue where we see Flagg himself, I feel like he's everywhere. He's everywhere in everything our characters are going through, despite being gone, despite being defeated. And I think this is very intentional that this idea that, like you said, with, with the, the hobbits and the Shire, um, that, that evil has been defeated, but evil is never tr- truly gone. Mm-hmm. And so we, we continuously see it. And I just love even even the death that is kind of starting to invade Stu uh, is reminiscent of descriptions of the of the dark man himself. That's a good comparison. I didn't I didn't see that. But yeah. No, and, and also just anytime we get into Kojak's head or, or any kind of non-human POV, it's it's delightful. And and also I think it works really well here because it emphasizes that kind of other otherworldliness of the evil. It does. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. Uh, just when things seem completely lost for old Stu, Matt's predictions prove right once again, as what you said last week was, of course, completely right, Matt. Uh, Tom Cullen shows up and is here to save the day. I sure I sure do love Tom Cullen. How about you? He is absolutely delightful. Um, he is 
one of the highlights of the book, maybe. I mean, just he he brings me such happiness, right? In, in a book that yeah. can be quite dark at times. Um, he is, you, you've said before that Stephen King is at root a softy, despite mm-hmm. the fact that he, he writes a lot of dark stuff and, and, you know, entertains us with that darkness. But then I think a character like Tom and the fact that Tom plays this role here at the end um, really speaks to kind of the, the inner his, his sort of deeper convictions about about the goodness of the world yeah i totally agree um and there's something there's something that that's happened to tom right because we get this line here i'm bad sick tom fever listen to me right tom's listening just tell me what to do tom leaned forward and Stu thought why he looks brighter is that possible where had Tom been? And so it's this real moment of, oh, Tom has changed too. Tom has gone through an experience as well, and it has changed him as a person, which is not something we really had necessarily talked about up until this point. Right. You know, he kind of had his own spirit quest, his own emptying out of the vessel, uh, just like they did, right? Except he yeah. did it all on his own. Um, and and of course, he was guided by Nick, but only only be, via via dreams, yeah. So, so yeah, definitely Tom, I think, has also sort of leveled up in that way. I love that. Yeah. Uh, Tom, of course, while while helping Stu, keeps asking about Nick over and over again, sensing, knowing something's wrong. And Stu finally tells him the truth that Nick is dead. I, I don't know. I, I just kind of adore this reaction to, to that news, though. Uh, Tom, you know, kind of silently cries and he says, he was my main man, Stu. Did you know that? Stu reached out and took Tom's big hand. I knew, Tom. Yes, he was. M-O-O-N. That spells my main man. I miss him awful. But I'm going to see him in heaven. Tom Collin will see him there. And he'll be able to talk, and I'll be able to think. Isn't that right? It wouldn't surprise me at all, Tom. I I just, there's something absolutely, like, simple and, and, and beautiful about that sentiment there, right there. And, and you know, I, I, this is this is why religion is such a powerful thing for so many people, right? That that yeah, That's a statement that you can say and, and kind of say and know and believe with, with certainty right it's one of the things i love about books too is that in a book you know in this context where we have all of this clearly magical religious stuff happening we can just be like yes yes tom <laughs> you will <laughs> yes and, that is absolutely going and, to happen yeah and that gives you a great feeling of, of like resolution and closure where you know we, we we were sad that nick died and it, and it still is sad that nick died but also yeah. we're like well he's gonna get to see tom in heaven and they're gonna hang out and that's Ultimately, everything is going to be fine for them because because it's a book and it controls its own metaphysics, and so that's mm-hmm. what happens. Sure, yeah, no, I, I think that's a great point. Um, that's the, one of the one of the wonderful things about fiction and getting to read is that that you don't have to you don't have to sit here and be thinking. Well, I mean, does heaven exist? Is the clearing at the end of the path of what we what we want it to be? It's like, well, yeah. In this book, we can say yes, and we don't have to worry about that. We don't have to mm-hmm. doubt it. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. But in the here and now, Stu is sick and he needs to get some real medicine real quick or he is going to die. Stu decides that the only hope they have is to hotwire a car or at least jumpstart a car uh, and drive to the closest town, which is too far away for them to walk in, in his current condition. Of course, the problem here, Matt, is that all the car batteries in the area would be dead by now because they were sitting out there baking in the sun for months and months. Um, but that's OK, because if they find a manual transmission car uh, and push it down a big enough hill, they can just get it to second or third gear and jump start it without the need of a battery. Uh, this is one of those moments where I'm like, oh, man, if the stand was set in 2022, they'd just kind of be fucked. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like, I don't know what the percentage of vehicles that are, are are manual these days, but it has to be considerably lower than it was when this book was written, right? Yeah, right. I, it's, I feel like it's got to be in single digit percentage. For sure, I mean, for sure. One, one of the cars that I've owned was actually manual, but that was because specifically sought it out. Um, not because that's what they were selling, right? I, that's, um, I mean, I really think if you if you drive a manual right now in in today's day and age, and and your car is not like twenty thirty years old, you're you're doing it because you specifically choose to drive a manual, right? Exactly, yeah. You know, it, it's I, I I was thinking about this. I was like, maybe maybe nowadays the batteries are a bit more robust, and like the electrical mm-hmm. systems of the cars might be a bit better designed, so there's less draw on the batteries when they're just sitting idle, but yeah, th- there's a limit though. And I, I know you you let it sit for months. I think it is eventually going to, um, 
flatten out. But I don't I don't know. I don't know that much about modern cars, especially because they've just computerized them to such an extent that it's like, I, I don't know, maybe it would be impossible. Maybe, maybe they'd just be totally screwed. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I, it's, you're so right about like modern cars. I, I remember. I have you. I mean, you've obviously probably had a dead battery and needed to jump your car at some time. Yeah, yeah. I feel like just doing that is also getting more complicated. Like, for whatever reason, I've never been able to successfully jump my car off of a Mercedes. Like, they mm. just it just <laughs> won't work. Like, I do. I go through the same steps and it just never works. And it's like. It, and it, it's not just like one Mercedes. It's like if I've ever been in a situation where I need a battery jumped and I look around as, oh, there's a Mercedes there. Welp, no help there. Going to need to find a different. I don't know. It's weird. That's, like the, the more complicated cars get these these basic functions that we rely on so much in these more manual type functions are kind of just going going away. Yeah, interesting. Maybe they somehow regulate the voltage coming out of the battery. That yeah, yeah, I don't know. That's, that's, that's quite interesting. I, I just went random comment every car i've ever owned up until this current minivan that i have has that's at one point or another run down the battery <laughs> the minivan however is magical because the kids will like leave lights on or leave doors open or leave things plugged into the to the charger at night and just just no matter how they abuse it the battery never dies fascinating um, so i uh I, I low key, pre- I, I, I low key think that this is like the minivan designers being like, we know that kids are going to abuse the electrical system, so we have to design it to just turn everything off after a bit. <laughs> um, like you can't, you can't trust the the, the user in this particular case. Yeah, um, that's just this week's episode brought to you by the concept <laughs> of minivans. By yes, by by the minivan lobby. Yeah, <laughs> we will never own one. My wife is like, no, not happening. I I, I kind of like I see the I see the convenience factor for sure. Having a kid yeah. I think changes that on me. Like yeah. well, man, having, having a door that slides is so much easier to get a kid in and out of. Oh my god. Well, having three kids. Oh yeah. You know, good good luck with anything other than a minivan. I mean, I guess you could have like a big <laughs> SUV or something, but that has its own problems, right? Yeah, even still, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so eventually, they find a car that might work. It, it happens to be at the very top of the hill, so it's possibly their last chance. And this is when Stu thinks about the hand of God that Tom mentioned being involved in the explosion. Uh, and he he wonders to himself, is this, is this what I, what's happening here? The events of this, the hand of God as well. And, and I think that's where, this is the part where I really wanted to dive into this question with you, right? Um, because as we talked last week about how everything in the ending up until this chapter kind of fit together, kind of like clockwork, like that, that, you know, the reasoning for everyone being here, the the role each individual character had to play and how the events at the end of, of flags Vegas played out had ha, why they had to be there, where they contributed all these things. The question here with Stu is does God need Stu to live? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, like, obviously the, the, one of the goals here is to have someone be able to make it back to Boulder to report to the people of, of the Boulder free zone, what happened to let them know that they are safe now to let them know how it happened. You know, you could say a nuclear explosion that everyone else that we sent has died, but couldn't Tom do that? I think he could. Mm-hmm. A- a- and so the, the question is like, it seems like to to your to your point god's like pulling all the stops out here to make sure that that Stu has the best chance of survival possible and the question is is there a god's plan reason for that um and i'm curious what your take is so i, I will answer your actual question but first i want to maybe broaden the question sure. um or or the, or the topic because this is something that i've been thinking about maybe we've kicked it around a bit before but basically <sighs> Stu survives, Larry dies, Nick dies, other side characters that we like a lot die. But I, I liked Larry and Nick better than I liked Stu. And, you know, sorry if you hate me for saying that. That's just <laughs> how I feel. Um, so, you know, it, it just feels to me calculated and intentional to set up multiple interesting characters 
and then kill off, in my personal opinion, the more interesting ones, leaving the one without any particular strong dramatic arc or or internal tension to survive to the end. Um, so so that that's one thing is like is like Stu being the one that survives is actually a surprise to me because I was like it just seems like we're setting this guy up to be like the white hat cowboy who then gets tragically gunned down and that's why it's sad is like ah oh, he was such a he was such a mensch and now he's dead and that that mm-hmm. sucks but he didn't have that like heart divided against itself complexity that we had in some of our other characters um and yet he's the one who gets to live okay so then to return to your question why does he need to live like why couldn't he have been another sacrifice mm-hmm. um did God literally only need three sacrifices? I, that, that that doesn't sound right to me. Like, um, what purpose does he serve going forward into the future? He didn't need, you know, what you sort of, I think, just now implied is like he didn't need to like show up and like help perform the C-section on Franny's baby. He, he didn't have to like defeat anything when he got home. There was yeah. no Saruman at the Shire, at the, the Shire for him to take care of. It was it was all fine. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, what I, I don't, I am. I'm not answering your question, really. I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm like, I don't see it. Actually, it's like the, the closest thing to an answer that I actually have is, well, Franny needed somebody to take her and the baby away from Boulder. Yeah, I, I do. I do think there's an answer to this question, actually. Um, and and I kind of want to wait until the very end of the book to answer it because I think it's that's that's the part where the answer is revealed to me, at least. But I, I also just generally like this as you know we've we've had many conversations over the past few weeks about the kind of the cruelty of of god's plan in in the in this book um and how god can be cruel sometimes and i also like to think of this as just an example of you know god doesn't isn't always that way you know Mm -hmm. that that like you know we we needed these people to go on the sacrifice but we didn't actually need them all um, and, and so we, we leave Stu here and it's funny because it's not even like, you can't even do it. It's like, well, oh, Stu is there because Franny needs help raising her child. Um, but <laughs> we learn that, that Larry was going to father some children as well. Right. Mm-hmm. And so Larry was not spared despite the fact that he was going to have kids, kids of his own. So it's not just the, the father factor or, or mm-hmm. not just simply, oh, he was going to be a father that, that caught, co- that causes God to stay his hand or something. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's really fascinating. And, and the answer that I do have, I'm not even sure if it's a good one. It's just kind of what I came up with while, while working through this, but I don't know. I I think it's, I think it's perhaps one of the questions Stu is asking himself. And one of the questions we're meant to be asking is, you know, this whole thing, why Stu, why, why Larry, why Ralph, like, why did, why did it have to play out this particular way? Yeah, I mean, framed that way, it does kind of give you the uh, Saving Private Ryan earn this mm-hmm. vibe where, where like now Stu has to be like just the best father, you know, to to this boy who is, by the end, we're going to compare the boy to Jesus for for reasons that will yeah. be obvious. Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 Stu will be, you know, the f- the father of the child, even though he knows he's not the father of the child, much like Joseph. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I guess we're just gonna do it now. That's fine. <laughs> but you, you're yeah. kind of you're, you're stepping on my points. And, but yeah, sorry. Um, no, no, it's it's totally fine. I I think I think this is it. I, I do. I, I think this like Stu, like the rest of them, went through this this experience. You know, when when Stu fell, when Stu left the rest of the group, he had still kind of gone 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 through the emptying of the vessel experience, and mm-hmm. it, it 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 enlightened him. It wisened him he lived through so so it is not to me just a matter of someone needs to go back to boulder and tell people what happened it's someone needs to go back to boulder and teach people about what happened and what it means and what Mm. what it says about what what we should and shouldn't do and so the scenes at the end where where Stu is thinking of you know talking to his future son about about the, the ways they should live what they should and should not do what they should remember you know the, these things seem key to me and and i love tom to death I, I do but i don't think he would be capable of uh communicating that type of stuff to you know the next generation in a way that that Stu could 
I think Stu is one of the few people who who actually does deeply understand the message that the the old ways are the man in black's ways mm-hmm. and they're going to have to break with those ways if they if they want to have any hope of survival. Yep. Um that's one of the things that he has picked up I think more or less uniquely among the surviving characters. Yeah. So And it's not yeah. that Franny I don't think would not agree with that. I think she would, but I do think there's something unique about the experience that that Stu and the rest of the the others went through mm-hmm. on that journey, you know. That's what it, it's why it's not the only we weren't just making a big deal about the emptying of a vessel for those three characters who were about to give their life. It's for all four of them. You know, like if 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 they just wanted Stu to, you know, know what happened the you know god could have done it in a number of ways but to it to be several weeks into the journey where he's already kind of had this profound change before he separated from the rest of them um and spared i think i think that matters yeah that makes sense to me i like that a lot cool all right so this chapter ends on this perfectly tense wonderful scene where where Stu manages to get the car started in the nick of time and he and tom are off and they drive back east and they make it to the nearest town where Stu finally collapses from exhaustion and that's that's where our chapter ends yep so we move on to chapter 75 this chapter begins with tom once again talking to ghost nick who is explaining to tom what an infection is and i just love i love the charged language here infection's the most dangerous thing there is tom infection was what made the superflu germ kill all the people and infection is what made people want to make the germ in the first place an infection of the mind um, it's one of those things where you're reading it and I don't know when I read for the stuff I'm I'm trying to find metaphor and make connections and I'm reading Nick say this and I'm like, oh, it's just like it's like a, a metaphor. And then, of course, Stephen King being Stephen King just says, yes, it is, Scott. Here, I will I will make it for you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I will. I will. Yeah, I will describe the metaphor perfectly. I, I think King is trying to make sure that we don't get out of this book without understanding the notion that the the infection of the mind is really what this book is about that mm-hmm. that you know the old ways slash randall flags ways slash the infection of the mind the the self-destructive nature of humankind all of these things are the same thing and uh uh there will have to be a sort of spiritual shift in humankind to free ourselves of that uh otherwise we're doomed to repeat the same self-destructive cycles that we always have Mm -hmm. yeah no i think you're right and and, i mean this is this is exactly what the book is about i mean Mm -hmm. and it's Mm -hmm. uh, you know to call the book justice uh, the final stand between good and evil i think misses a big part of this and i think that's why that's why you know to answer your question of why we spent so long on this it's really to to give us time to really drill this message in here at the end Mm -hmm. yeah uh, so Nick explains that Stu will almost certainly die, but if God wills it, he will live. And then he gives him the tools to make it so, showing him the antibiotics to give him, telling him how to take care of him, telling him to walk him, to keep him warm, to give him aspirin, kind of teaching him how to fight this infection. And, and here's the part that I think maybe really wrinkles your brain, because when Nick disappears after this whole speech, the four antibiotics he mentioned are set out on the countertop in front of Tom already. And the question you have to ask yourself is, how how did that happen? Um, to the extent that I thought this through, Tom did it while he was possessed, and then he didn't have any memory of it. That's the answer. I guess that's <laughs> a fair answer. It's a boring answer. Do you think that they t- teleported? No, I oh. think that th- three months ago, some rando walked by mm. and happened to pick up some bottles of antibiotics, and on his way selecting which antibiotics you want he just lined them up on the counter and then he left some because this is the the machinations of god that okay yeah you know some random person completely unconnected months ago walks through oh, i don't need these i'll just take this one i think maybe every once in a while god is just just kind of cuts corners though and he's like i'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm already possessing the guy i'll just i'll just lay him out there ah that- look hey where'd they come from <laughs> This is boring. God, <laughs> write yourself a better story, bud. No, I mean, I like I, I like the way you, I like your theory better. 
All right, so the next two weeks go by, and, and Stu does manage to beat back the pneumonia with his near death taken care of. The decision now comes, what should they do? Should they try to get back to Boulder now? Should they wait for winter to end? Or or should they or should they go right now? And that is when the dreams start, Matt. More dreams. Dreams have been such a huge part of this book, and here they are back at the end of it. Uh, this time in the dreams, Stu sees Franny giving birth. The baby is in breach, uh, which for those of you who don't know, that means it's not head first, it's legs first, and and that's uh, bad. It's very bad. Mm-hmm. That's not a good thing to happen. Um, and, and later, we don't see all the dreams here right now in the moment, but later in the dreams, we'll see that Franny does give birth, and, and the thing she gives birth to is Randall Flagg himself, which is a very charged image, and I'm curious what your what your interpretation of these dreams and maybe that specific Randall Flaggian dream is. Yeah, it took me a, a bit to to puzzle it out, but I think I have something that I'm happy with. Sure. Um, you know, I I think I, I think that the role of the dreams on a doyless level are King wants us to be anxious that all of this has been for nothing. The baby's gonna die. Um, and, and that there won't be any more people and, and it's, it's, it doesn't matter that you defeated flag because humankind is, is going to be extinct anyway. Um, I guess you could also call that the, the Watsonian level. It doesn't matter. It's <laughs> both, both us and the characters are worried about the same thing. Um, and then I think the idea of, of the baby being flag is like, well, that's just a metaphor for the idea of death because flag is a metaphor for for death and destruction. So mm-hmm. g- giving birth to flag would be akin to the baby dying. It's, it's a metaphor for hopelessness. Um, yeah, no, I, I like that. I agree with it. I think to, to expand on that a little bit, I think just the idea of what we've been talking about, about this, this idea of defeating evil and yet evil never truly dying. Mm-hmm. And the idea that, you know, tomorrow's Randall flag can be born from, from today's survivors that, that if, mm-hmm. if we don't learn from our mistakes, if we don't change, then you know we we are just birthing the tools of our destruction once again um yeah i think that, that slots nicely into that as well yeah that's, that's an interesting idea i one thing i wanted to say about the whole the whole situation is like um i think i i sort of expected that Stu's journey back was going to be quick you know like mm-hmm. like but king decided to make this into an, a, a big ordeal you know we we yeah. have we have this almost this entire section is this journey, right? It, it it could have been Tom shows up, they quickly find a car. There's no infection, bada bing, bada boom. They're back in Boulder. Um, instead, there's all this tension and uncertainty and danger. And, and I think that's meant to reinforce this idea that we're talking about here, where you're not supposed to feel comfortable. You're not mm-hmm. supposed to feel done because it's never actually done. Yeah. No, I think you're, I think you're onto something there for sure. Yeah, I mean, I could kind of like close my eyes and and imagine a different version of this where like, you know, you can kind of see like Tom is talking to Nick about, oh, I don't know if Stu's going to survive the fever and then like end scene and then we pick up again in Boulder months later. Yeah, And right. it's like that we see them kind of make the final bit of their journey. It's like, oh, he did live. Look, he's here. They made it back. That kind of thing. Instead, yeah. we instead we stay with we stay with Stu all the way until he gets into Boulder itself. We don't cut away from Stu and go to Franny's perspective uh, until like right before uh, he rejoins her. Yeah. Well, and, and just the whole idea that he gets this infection and barely survives and none of that's, I mean, I, I sort of hate this word, but none of that's necessary mm-hmm. to, to our conclusion of the story, but it is, it is necessary for this sort of specific sub theme of, just because you defeated Randall Flagg doesn't mean everything is good forever now. Yeah, in that line, to to go back to Nick's infection metaphor here, that like Stu having to barely survive this infection is kind of like him going through a, a microcosm of what mm. the, the the Earth will hopefully go through. That that humanity has barely survived their infection. Um, they are they are now they you know barely make it through by the skin of their teeth by you know. 0.4 percent of, of people now and now okay we've made it we've made it through we've survived what next and i think it's the same for Stu. Stu that Stu is asking himself okay what next what 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 is life going to be now 
I mean, one, okay, here, here's yet another thing that I hadn't thought of until this moment is that Nick and Larry both have a, a lot of suffering on their journey. Mm-hmm. Nick, Nick, Nick has a lot of physical suffering, some amount of mental suffering. Larry has a lot more sort of spiritual and mental suffering. Sure. Um, Stu has some amount from being in the, um, in the prison and having to fight his way free. But kind of after that point passes, he doesn't have nearly as much struggle and suffering. And maybe the story is saying sort of for him to, to reach his sort of spiritual potential, he has to go through some amount of suffering also. So he, he breaks his leg horribly painful. He lives out in the ditch for days with the eating gophers and then he gets this horrible infection. So, so now he's sort of, (laughs) you know, on par with those other characters in terms of the, the burdens that he's had to, to overcome. Um, Yeah, no, I think you're out of something there for sure. I like that. Not so sure if I have it exactly clear, but definitely the idea of like the different characters going through personal ordeals of suffering is a thing in in the story. Yeah. And, and you're absolutely right that Stu outside of the early parts of the book really did not go through an acute version of that himself. You know, I think there was, you know, the, the general, anxiety and worries of the all members of the boulder free zone and of course the the sadness at at losing their friends but Mm -hmm. you're absolutely right that Stu himself did not go through much ordeal uh outside the very beginning of the book until until this moment right yeah i I really love uh, just speaking about this kind of section as a whole the domestic scenes of tom and Stu's you know, not only their journey, but also just their life. Like uh, at this point in the book, they're kind of just holed up in the, the town of Grand Junction, uh, waiting out a blizzard. And and I love this bit where where Stu finds a, a projector and sets it up and plays movies for Tom. And this this really, this really beautiful part. Um, now thinking about that, Stu smiled. Someone who didn't know better would have called him dumb. He could have hooked a VCR up to a much smaller Jenny, and then they could have watched hundreds of movies that way, probably right in the Holiday Inn. But movies on TV were not the same. Never had been, to his way of thinking. Which uh, is just endearing me to to Stephen King and, and to Stu as well, because I totally agree uh, yeah. that getting to watch a film on film with a projector is so much better than especially since VCR was such a crappy, like it was, it was super popular and I understand why, but like, uh, everything was, it, everything looked like shit uh-huh. on VCR. It was so it bad. I mean, it's so funny. Cause at the time, if you had asked me, I would have been like, no, it's fine. But like now, now that we have something good to compare it to, it's like, Oh my God, how did we get by <laughs> with this? Yeah. Um, this, no, this I think has to be a scene that was cut it, or, or it, not in the original, right? Um, it, it, just the yeah, idea yeah. of VCRs. Yeah, I checked. Um, I checked the uh, the report from this week, and it does seem that this part was cut. Um, I think the entire movie sequence was cut. Actually, wow, that um, makes me sad. I, I love I, it. I think I think that's what they said. Yeah, no, I love it too. Right? It's it's one of those moments of of lightness and sort mm-hmm. of just like character connection that I think makes up a lot of the meaningful connective tissue in a story. And King really understands that. And so when you you know, pressure him to take stuff out, you end up taking out stuff like this, where it's like, well, it's not important. It's not, it's not plot important, but it's like, it's not plot important, but it, it's the, it's, it's the reason why you care about what you're reading in the first place. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, like, I think it's important, like, I don't know. We've seen Tom have this incredibly close relationship with Nick. And I think that's wonderful and lovely. And, and frankly, I wish we got a little bit more of it. I think if, if I had one critique about that, particular part of the book it's that i wish we saw a little bit more of nick and tom um i think once they get to boulder free zone they're kind of so segmented from each other that nick has so much going on with the committee and everything that outside of you know sending tom to his almost certain doom they don't actually get that much time to interact with each other but um i think it's important to to show this interaction here between these two characters and so it is one of those moments that just builds their relationship a little bit and you you grow to care about them as individuals, but also them as, as friends and and companions on this on this arduous journey. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting point you made. That like I, I wouldn't, I totally wouldn't mind another you know adventures of Tom and Nick toward the beginning of the of the book like that. That would have sat right with me actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, because outside the Julie bit, we, there's just not too much actually. Right. We just kind of yada yada everything that happens to them after that point. 
Yeah, that's my recollection. There's the Julie bit, there's the tornado, and then I, I yeah, I, mm-hmm. that, that's it, yeah. But then uh, here's another, I think, may, perhaps slightly complicated thing that we have to talk about here, Matt, because uh, Stu is continuing to have the dreams of, of Franny and the, the childbirth, and it's it's causing him a lot of anxiety. And instead of waiting out the winter, Stu basically makes the decision that they have to chance it now. Um with hindsight, I think we know that this is a really interesting choice because narratively, it is not like, as you said, Stu arriving in Boulder does anything. He, he has no evil to defeat. He has nothing to fight. He has no MacGuffin to bring. He doesn't save Franny's life, nor does he save Peter's life. Peter recovers on his own, entirely independent of, of Stu. Um, I guess you could argue that Stu's return gives the community, gives the Boulder Free Zone hope and strength that that perhaps will allow them to survive the rest of an arduous winter, possibly. Mm-hmm. But outside of that, you know, our character is basically choosing to make the journey infinitely more dangerous, risk his life, risk Tom's life for what we know in in retrospect is no real reason. And I'm curious what your takeaway from that is i don't have a good answer for this one i I did think about it um thought harder than i would have because you asked me to um (laughs) you know i this is pretty harebrained i think but i I find myself wondering if Stu's return doesn't actually save the baby somehow like he did just fight off the flu himself maybe he's like bringing defeated flu virus i i know this isn't how you know disease works at all <laughs> but I'm, I'm like i'm really reaching for something where we do have this like parallel of like him and the baby are both fighting off of a flu and, and he defeats it and then he comes back and then the baby is also able to defeat his um but uh i i don't i don't think that's correct i'm just it's just a thought that i had mm-hmm. um i i think the idea that he needs to be there is more a emotional beat where it's just like he he really feels like he needs to be there for franny mm-hmm. and whether the baby survives or not he needs to be there for franny and that's important enough for him to take risks yeah i mean what i'm doing here is interesting because obviously like from a character perspective from like a individual like Stu's perspective of this the decision makes complete sense to me, right? Like mm-hmm. it just, it just makes total sense. His desire to do this, his willingness to risk everything to do it. I, I'm just wondering if we can pull something larger thematically out of that, because from a plot perspective, it doesn't actually accomplish anything. Like if, if theoretically, if Stu had gotten, you know, trapped inside one of the snowed in tunnels or, or just froze to death on his journey, nothing fundamentally would have changed as far as the survival of, of Franny and, and Peter. Um, but possibly like, possibly, I actually, yeah. I actually love what, you, what you're saying there. And I guess my interpretation wouldn't be a literal um, scientific antibodies are brought that uh, aid son, but just like spiritually and, uh-huh. and metaphysically the return of stew, the, the return of hope, the return, you know, like, it, it, it's kind of you can kind of imagine a town like what the the mood in the boulder free zone was in the days before Stu came home right that you know they they sent these people over they sent their leaders their the four members of their committee their leaders over there they've heard nothing from them since they don't know what's going on it's january now they things are getting cold they have power yes and that's good and and they're living and then the first baby is born and the baby gets captain trips and so like not only are we going to be defeated by the dark man whenever but now there's not even hope for the continuation of the species and Stu comes home and with Stu comes everything with Stu comes. Oh, we've defeated the bad guys with Stu comes. Oh, Peter's going to live. And even if he's not directly responsible for that, it is the turning of a tide in a spiritual sense that, that brings new life and new hope and new opportunity to, to the community. And perhaps without him, it would not have played out that way. Yeah. And the fact that it's connected to, to Christmas symbolically, Sure. Um, seems important because if you think about it like the birth of Christ, you know, religion wise 
it was not like a moment that mattered in any way other than, well, this is the birth of the figure who will then go on to do all of this amazing stuff. Mm-hmm. But, the, but we celebrate the birth because that is the symbolic moment where that's like the 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 arrival of of hope, right? The yeah. birth of Christ is the arrival of hope. It's not the culmination or the deliverance. It's just the the arrival, um, yeah. and and so that's that's what the, yeah I, I like that. That's what Stu's arrival is. Is it, it's the arrival of hope back to Boulder. I like that a lot. Cool. Um. All right. So uh, regardless, they they choose to go, and the next few pages of our chapter is chronicle Stu and Tom's journey east. It's a perilous, cold one, and and we don't need to go into too much detail on it because it's just a lot of walking in the cold um, and suffering. Uh, one thing I did want to point out was was the imagery though, because there's this really interesting thing where as the snow continues to build, there is white covering everything. There's this really wonderful moment where they're resting on the top of a snow and Stu does like a little digging and realizes that just a few inches below him is the top of one of the cars that, uh, you know, one of the cars that litters the highway as people died while driving at trying to drive out of town. And so it's this, this kind of wonderful image. I think that, you know, there's all this death underneath them. There's all this, this horror, this, this blackness, but on top of that is, is the white, that has come to kind of like cover it up and and clean the slate and bring new hope and new opportunity. Um, I, I really, really like this. Well, I, I like it too, but it's interesting to me because I can't help but take the metaphor in two different ways. Um, well, one of which being, I think, I think what you were saying, a new beginning, a fresh start, wiping away the stains of the past. Um, but then the other way is like, well, but the past isn't gone. It's just, it's just right there. It's buried right under the snow. Um, it's, it's in a shallow grave. Um, I, I think tonally, <laughs> I think the first interpretation is the one that, that we're going for here though. No, but I think, I think it can be both. I, I mm-hmm. like that a lot, actually. I hadn't, I hadn't gone there, but as you're saying it, I think that makes a lot of sense too, that, that the idea that, yeah, like the, the white has come, you know, I think as, as was beautifully put in the talisman, right. The, the return of the white was this God, I, I love that part of that book so much. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, that's that's kind of what's happened here, and and we represent that literally with the white snow, which is not the first time we've used a a white object. Like it, it was the it was the movie screen before with Nadine, um, but we've used a white object to represent the power of the white. And here, the white has returned. But but just because it's here doesn't mean that 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 blackness, that darkness, has gone for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Uh, speaking of Christmas, it's Christmas time, uh, which is of course the best holiday ever, and as you've already stated, has a, a, a probably just a little bit more charged of a meaning in this incredibly religious book we've been reading for the past few months. Um, we see here that Stu surprises Tom with some wonderful gifts on Christmas morning, and Tom feels bad that he didn't get Stu anything. And uh, and Stu, of course, says, yes, you did. And I, I just, I'm just going to read this here because I really love it. If you hadn't come along when you did, I would have died in that washout west of Green River. And if it hadn't been for you, Tom, I would have died of pneumonia or the flu when it was back there in the Utah hotel. I don't know how you picked the right pills, if it was Nick or God or just plain old luck, but you did it. You get no, you got no sense calling yourself a dummy. If it hadn't been for you, I never would have seen this Christmas. I'm in your debt. Tom said, oh, that ain't the same, but he was glowing with pleasure. It is the same, Stu said seriously. I don't know why, but I, I love I love the way the text emphasizes the last thing Stu says. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you could have just ended the conversation there. Oh, that ain't the same. He kind of brushes away, but you can see, obviously, but he was glowing with pleasure. Like he he's taken it. He's taken Stu's meeting. And Stu needs to needs to understand. No, 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 you don't understand. Like, this is what's important. What yeah. you did for me, that it, like that that is a thing that matters. And you need to understand that that's a thing that matters. Yeah. That like, I, I love it. It is the same. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a true gift. And, and, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, to be, to be literal about it, Tom worked way harder to keep Stu alive than Stu did to, you know, get him a couple of presents. Right. And, mm-hmm. and, and Stu's aware of that. So it's, I, I, I think Tom, Tom just did Tom just did Tom, right? He just did what he thought yeah. was right. And that's, that's yeah. why Tom is great. Um, but he deserves to be praised for it. Mm-hmm. 
I love the infinity symbol that Stu gives Tom, you know, like this is obviously more charged meaning here, right? Infinity forever. You know, this is very, very charged symbol for us here, right? Yeah, you can kind of see it as a symbol of the white, although I don't think it's ever been um, portrayed that way before that I can think of. Yeah. So then we have this beautiful rendition of the first Noel from Tom. Uh, a Christmas song that I don't know. I absolutely adore. I think it's a very beautiful song. Uh, it never ceases to move me, no matter how many times I've, I've, I've uh, listened to it. And this is like I don't know. I we've talked about this already, but I love I love Tom. I love Tom so much, and I I think it is absolutely fair when people call Tom a problematic character at times because our increased understanding of folks with mental disabilities like Tom's um, has, has in, especially in, in the last decade or so has, has grown so much that, that some of Tom's depictions look a little dated by comparison to what we understand now. But the thing I love about Tom is the way King treats this character with, with, with not just kindness, but like richness and complexity. You know, Tom is not, wholly defined by you know his his brain and what his brain can and can't do you know we are we are constantly surprised by time's capability his ability his complexity and like i just love this moment where he just starts singing this song and it's this this the book really sells you on this being this this beautiful rendition of this beautiful christmas song and it's like i didn't even know he could do that and that's Mm -hmm. awesome and i love it yeah well, I, I think King is using the idea of, of a character like Tom very intelligently here because it's the, the point is that, you know, intellect isn't all that matters, like heart and, and courage um, and the willingness to give of, of oneself is actually what matters because that's that's what that's what Tom brings. Yeah. And yeah. and so it, it elevates the value of those things. And, you know, the, the, the intellect, the cold intellect is something of Randall Flagg. Mm-hmm. If, if anything um it's it's, it's almost in, it, you could you could almost say that in king's view the intellect is a kind of curse um on mankind that that, that tom is free of actually hmm, um, i like that but i, I like your uh pointing out the first noel because like it's it's a lovely song it's it's probably my favorite of the like somber slow christmas songs that are in the popular rotation um And it's one of those ones that focuses on the religious side of things, right? There's no Santa Claus in it. It's about the birth of Christ. Noel means like a a, a birth, basically, um, Mm -hmm. to be born, literally, I think. Um, Yeah. And and of course, it it, it is a song absolutely about the first Christmas, right? Like mm -hmm. the the first song is the first Noel. It is the first Christmas. It is the birth of Christ. And I mean, there is something I think very poetic about the idea that he's singing the song on the first Christmas uh, after in this new world, in this, this post plague world that this is, this is the first one. Um, And I don't know. It's, it's really beautiful. Yeah. Love it. Uh, Tom also still has a bit of, bit of shine in him though, Matt, um, because he goes into a trance and, and he tells Tom, uh, Stu in this moment that, that flag never truly dies. He's still out there in the wolves and the other creatures and everything. And then he also just leaves us a little, little <laughs> tension inducing moment where he says Franny is, is going to be fine. And, and, but something, something will happen with, with her baby. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I like the textual establishment of the idea that flag never dies because mm-hmm. again, flag represents the human tendency towards self-destruction, which will never die just because you defeat one yeah. manifestation of it. So, yep. Yep. I love it so much. Um, so their journey continues, Matt. Uh, we get into January now. They're going slow and steady. Uh, I think one of the things that I want to point out in this section is is some of the most haunting imagery to me is when they have to go through the mountain tunnels. Uh, the book, you know, I think aptly references back to its earlier tunnels, you know, the Lincoln Tunnel and the Eisenhower Tunnel that that we've had our characters have to go through, uh, which is perfect. Um, but just the idea of, of not only are they having to go through these tunnels, but they're like having to dig through the snow to even get into them and then navigate the tunnel. And then the other side is blocked as well. So then they have to dig through the snow with the other side. Uh, it's just, I don't know, terrifying, <laughs> absolutely terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. Um... All jokes about Shelob aside, uh, <laughs> the book has definitely sort of punctuated multiple important tunnels um, throughout the the story. The, the, they sort of act as section breaks to the story, um, like like separators between parts in a in a sense. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and I mean, this is a thing that King does in this book a lot. You're right, but I think it's a thing that King does generally. I'm thinking back to, I think I called this out, you know, when we got to the section in the in the talisman. I think I said, you know, we're going to be talking about another tunnel here in a few months. Um, but but uh, Jake's traveling through. Uh, I used the wrong name, didn't I? Jax. Jax, yeah. thank you. I knew I was going to do that. Jax yeah. traveling through his tunnel. Um, uh, early on in that book, you know, represents another terrifying, you know, journey through the unknown. Um, that it, it's it's a wonderful image. Like tunnel imagery is used in in literature all the time, but King definitely likes it. I think. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, so they're getting closer and closer, and then wouldn't you seem? Wouldn't you know it, Matt? Stu forgets to refill the gas can, and so our character Snowplow runs out of fuel just before the final stretch, and so they're made to walk the rest of the way. I, I, like, I don't know. I, I don't have much to say about this other than it just it just seems like intentionally poetic that they're returning to Boulder the exact way they left. You know, it, I just uh, Mother Abigail was like adamant about you know no no you're you're going to journey on foot out there and so it just seems that, that they left on foot and so when Stu comes back he's going to come back on foot right yeah um it seems it seems faded it seems um poetic uh, poetic yeah it's, it's great love it mm-hmm so at last, they make it to Plowed Roads, which represent civilization, rep- which represent Boulder. And uh, and then I wanted to talk about this part, Matt, because Tom says, we're in Boulder again. We really are. C-I-T-Y-L-I-M-I-T-S. That spells Boulder. Laws, yes. Wait. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> Tom can read? You know, I kind of love that it's left ambiguous because... Tom is clearly just saying the letters that he sees on the sign, and this mm-hmm. sign probably says Boulder City Limits, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's surprising that he can just read off the letters like that in the first place. Right, yeah. Which which reminds us that Stu did say that he seems brighter. Um, and that made me think about the comparison or the dichotomy or the contrast between uh, Flag making Lloyd brighter so that he would make him more useful servant and what we may be seeing here, which is the white giving Tom the gift of being brighter as a reward, perhaps after the hard work is already done, the white didn't need Tom to be smarter to accomplish the mission. This is just a boon, um, or, or so it seems to me anyway. Um, and, and I think that's an interesting thing to uh, to point out, even though it, like it's very subtle, right? It, it, we, we might not even it might not even be true. <laughs> There's really only a couple of, of data points that make us suspect that it might be true. But um, I like the idea of it anyway. No, I like this a lot. I, th- I think it, it actually makes me want to uh, attach on to your flag literally made uh, Lloyd smarter idea because Mm -hmm. it it does seem rather apt and poetic that like flag used this increase of intelligence as a, as a control mechanism for Lloyd It's like, Mm -hmm. you need me because look what I gave you. Look what I give you. Look what I can do for you. You know, it's Mm -hmm. a kind of, kind of the same offer that he, he made to Nick, right? This idea of like, if you come with me, you will be able to hear, you will be able to talk. And it's interesting that, you know, on, on the side of good, on the side of God, um, Nick can talk and hear now, right? Mm-hmm. Like he's talking and hearing with with Tom throughout this whole thing. It wasn't it wasn't cl- quite the the way he wanted it, but uh, he, he got there in the end as well. And so the idea that yes, like just that, that through his experience and through you know perhaps what what God has gifted him, Tom has become a little bit a little bit brighter as well, a little bit a little bit more able to to make the connections that we know exist in his minds. He just has has difficulty accessing it sometimes, maybe just a little bit able to access it a little bit more. Yeah. Because because you're right. I mean, this isn't technically reading, you're correct, but like the refrain throughout this book has been M O O N. You know, that spells whatever. And mm-hmm. he said that for everything. For like it, it, no matter what it is, <laughs> that is what that is what it spells. And then suddenly he's looking at a sign and saying things. And I think there is another moment where I didn't pull it out, but he says, uh, okay, that spells okay. And mm. is the only mm. other instance in the book where he's said anything besides M O O N. Yeah. Um, so he definitely, definitely is more, more able to, to understand for sure. Yeah. And this falls in proximity to, of course, to noticing like, Hey, he see, he seems brighter, which, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which I think, I think the thing that prime that, that has primed us to notice this, but um, yeah, I, I think it's a real thing actually. Yeah. I like it. 
I like it. And yeah, as 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 maybe not even a gift or a reward, but as just a a natural result of of allying yourself with the side of good. Yeah, yeah. So our characters made it, Matt. They they made it back, and the first thing Stu wants to hear about is his woman, as he says. Uh, we learn that Franny is alive. That the baby had to be delivered via cesarean, but uh, she's alive, and the baby is alive. But uh, unfortunately, the baby has Captain Trips. Um, and I'm curious if you can think back to earlier in the week, Matt. What what were you thinking at this point when you when you get that bit of information that the baby's sick, it has Captain Trips, and it most likely will die? What was your what was your thought? Well, I think at that moment I was thinking that the baby is going to die. Um, but then I was, I th- further was thinking, you know, that wouldn't necessarily mean that the world's going to end because we know that the baby is not a full blooded immune baby. Um, and, and so, in, in other words, any children of Stu and Franny might still survive just fine. So it's not like it wouldn't be a conclusive blow, but it would be a sort of, um, tragedy obviously like yes um part of me suspected i think i think at this point that king wanted franny to have Stu's baby but the story just didn't work out that way (laughs) and the timeline didn't work out that way i think i changed my mind on this due to subsequent thinking prompted by the next section that we're about to talk about sure maybe i'll talk about that when we get there yeah we can i I think it i think it the baby being a, a piece of the old world, I think feels important to me. So I don't know. Yeah. I, I think that's, that's kind of what I wanted to get at. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll get there. Um, well, so we move into chapter 67, 76. I don't know why I'm reversing these today. <laughs> uh, another extremely short chapter chapter. We're back with Franny in her bed. She's thinking of Peter, her father and Peter, her son, one dead and buried the other dying. I, I, I've read, this section many times uh, because I've read this book many times and this is the first time I've read it as a father and this hit me way more than I was expecting it to you know Mm -hmm. just the idea of just a woman sitting in 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 a hospital bed waiting for her child to die um, waiting for a doctor to walk in and deliver the news I can't I can't imagine anything anything worse than that experience And and I love how King kind of emotionally charges this and gets us into the emotions of this experience by kind of jumbling up Franny's past traumas and her current ones. And this she's, she's like half asleep and she's in this near sleep haze. I think it's just, just wonderfully written. Absolutely. Wonderfully. Yeah. I think it's maybe some of my favorite writing in this book. Not much to add. Just, yeah, really liked it. Yeah. I'm going to read a little part here. Her mind drifted cruising at some low level along the border of sleep, conning the terrain of her past and the landscape of her heart. She thought about her mother's parlor where the seasons passed in a dry age. She thought about Stu's eyes, about the first sight of her baby, Peter Goldsmith Redmond. She dreamed that Stu was with her in her room. And of course, (laughs) in that dream walks Stu in her room with her. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's just beautiful writing. I love it so much. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I love it. All right, so move on to chapter 77. Uh, Speaking of the baby, this is what the next chapter primarily deals with. Little Peter goldsmith redman who we learn here uh is going to live matt hooray he's going to live he caught the flu but apparently the immunities from his mother are just enough to help him um i love how it's described here every time the flu shifts peter is shifting right back at it george said there's still the technical possibility that he might relapse but he has never entered the final critical phase he seems to be wearing it out um i, I love this because you know we learn here that any children born of an immune and a not immune parent will probably have to go through the same thing um, and that they therefore could survive it. It's not guaranteed that they will, but they could survive it. And, and we learn, they, they postulate that any child born of two immune people probably won't have to go through this at all. Um, and this is a really interesting metaphor, is it not? It's as if each child directly connected to the old world has to go through its own kind of battle, its own kind of final stand, its own infection uh, in order to get to be able to exist in this in this new world. I like that a lot. I think that helps explain to me why, you know, we bothered to do this prolonged denouement with, with all of the struggle and and an effort put into getting getting home past all this adversity um i think it's another way of 
uh, another way of looking at this is, is to say that humanity will never be free of captain trips it's not mm-hmm. a thing that happened and then it's over it's it's hundreds of years later there's still going to be babies who were born um uh you know from you know the stock of people who are not fully immune and that they're still going to get sick and uh that's going to be it's going to be a thing forever and and i think that's you know yet more of this idea of you know randall flag never really dies you're never really free of of any yeah. of any of these curses but you but you're you're sort of doomed to continue to have to fight them but you can defeat them you can stand that, against them uh, yeah that's interesting because I, I mean you're right that like peter and you know whoever he gets with their child would be you know 25 percent or 75 percent immune right 25 yeah. percent uh, unimmune so theoretically they might have to go through a similar ordeal um, maybe yeah. not, maybe not as dangerous as what Peter had to go through, but m- m- we don't know. Like, yeah, I-, I like that idea that Captain Trips is still there, lying under the surface, and um, it, I-, I like that a lot. I like that a lot. Yeah, I don't really know how you know immune system genetics works, so it could be okay. That kid will be seventy five percent immune, and then the next generation will be, you know, ninety ish percent immune. But mm-hmm. but it could also be the case that there's just going to constantly be some amount of, of risk forever. Right. Yeah. Um, we don't know. Yeah. I like that. Uh, so Franny and Stu also discuss the death of Larry, Ralph and Glenn. Uh, Stu says, I think they were the sacrifice. God always asks for a sacrifice. His hands are bloody with it. Why? I can't say I'm not a very smart man. Perhaps we brought it on ourselves. All I know for sure is that the bomb went off over there instead of over here and we're safe for a while for a little while is flag gone really gone i don't know i think we'll have to stand a watch for him (gasps) he said stand he said the word stand (laughs) (laughs) yeah it's interesting here how you know despite being one of the victorious you know paladins of the white Stu very much sounds like franny here with his talk about god with blood on his hands like like franny's killer god cries um and he has this sort of almost resentment for all this suffering and pain but at the same time he understands like well there's the there's flag out there so yeah obviously we gotta we still gotta beat that guy yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it, it echoes something that we didn't talk about, but he was thinking about Mother Abigail early, earlier in this week's reading. And he says, you know, both that he loves her and, and hates her. Right. This this kind of like I love her for you know who she was and what she represented, but I also hate her for what she put me and the, and the ones that I care about through. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I like this. And, and I think I don't know. I there's, <laughs> there's something to me that is very satisfying, and I understand it's not satisfying to everyone. It might not be satisfying to you, but this idea of God always asks for a sacrifice. Why? I don't know. <laughs> uh-huh. Like, I mean, like when you think about it, like the idea of uh, like Christianity is defined by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for the sake of, of all mankind. Right. Like, and, and the, the basic question that is always asked by some people, including myself in the past is, well, if you're an all powerful God that can do anything whenever you feel like it, why do you need to go through that whole thing just to, just to, you know, allow souls to return to heaven again like why did we have why why did god's only son need to sacrifice himself on account of our souls that Mm -hmm. doesn't seem like it's you know logistically necessary right and and i think i i appreciate Stu's answer here because the answer is i don't know all i know is that we're alive and the bad people are dead and so feels feels pretty good to me yeah um i i i i i'm glad it worked out this way i I think it's frustrating and i will never understand it and i need to reckon with the fact that i will probably never understand it but here's what i will understand is that we're gonna have work to do still we we have we have stuff we need to do regardless of the whys of it all yeah i mean the so i'm gonna attempt a heavy lift here in connecting Mm -hmm. sort of this this view of of theodicy with the idea of of ka and kind of the greater ideas that we've talked about throughout let's fucking do it man i'm excited let's go so so, so there's this idea that the way that I would personally approach this, I've never heard it quite said this way before, but the, what I'm going to, this is how I'm going to phrase it is like, 
you know, okay, so like imagine I'm I, I I'm the all powerful God. I can do anything, and you're, you know, some human doesn't matter who. Let's just say that you're Scott for the sake of argument. Okay. And, and I'm like, you know what, Scott, I'm going to re- relieve your suffering. I'm going to make it so that you 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 no longer feel any more physical pain. In fact, I'm going to make it so that you never feel any more emotional pain. I'm going to make it so that nothing bad ever happens to anyone around you. Or no, I'm going to make it so that nothing nothing bad ever happens. And in fact, in fact, not only does nothing bad ever happen, but you're just always happy and nothing even happens to disturb that even transiently. In fact, I'm going to make it so that you're always just totally blissed out, maximum level bliss. You know what, Scott? You don't even need a body anymore, honestly. We're just going to, you're just <laughs> going to be like an orb experiencing bliss and, and nothing will ever, and nothing, nothing will ever change for you. And you'll just be a permanent floating orb of bliss. Does that sound good? Sound good to you? No. Should I do that? <laughs> no. So, so the point is to say, we don't actually know what's good for us. Uh-huh. Um, and, and which is another, another way of saying the Lord works in mysterious ways. Like sure. yeah. the, the, the struggle that we go through that provides us with all of the meaning and richness and complexity and value of our lives is part of it inextricably. The sacrifice is part of it inextricably. If you take those things away, then you, I'm not saying, I, I guess I am making an argument that there's a slip, slippery slope toward bliss orb um, where there's no <laughs> principled line. Like, like there, there, there's no line where you say like, this is the maximum amount of, of problems that God should fix and not beyond. Because it's like, well, why not, why not beyond, right? Why not make things even better? You know what I mean? Yes, no, I know exactly what you mean, and and I will never forget the phrase. There's a slippery slope toward bliss, or <laughs> good for the rest of my life. It's, um, it's no, I mean, I, I I I think I think your bliss orb like is supposed to be you know textually what heaven is for for Christians, right? Like like this this idea of eternal contentment and happiness and and no suffering. But I think most importantly, like the point of life is going through hardships and difficulty and, and happiness and, and wonder and grace and all these wonderful things prior to getting there. Right. And mm-hmm. so this is, this is a key part of the journey is going through these things, which include suffering and include uh, n- un- not understanding why things have to play out the way they do. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think that, I think that's absolutely in line with, with that idea. And, and on, on a personal level, I, I really, I really like that, this idea of, you know, it's it's another way of saying uh, the the AI made the Matrix the perfect version of itself, and and we hated it because we're stupid animals that don't yeah. actually know what we want at all. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. And, and I tried to kind of connect it to Ka because Ka is more along the lines of what wh- what is a good story, and what is a good story, I think, is very much similar to like what is a what is a meaningful life, not what mm-hmm. is a blissed out life but what is a meaningful life which may involve all kinds of struggle and suffering actually yeah yeah no i think i think you're right uh as we all know there's a slippery slope to bliss orb there's a slippery slope to bliss orb there's a slippery slope to talking about ka uh in any (laughs) given stephen king conversation i'm just gonna tweet right now without context from the kingslinger's twitter there's a slippery slope to bliss orb please just let people figure out what that means tomorrow that'll be fun (laughs) done <laughs> nice nice um okay so uh no that was a great conversation though i i i, I like i like your view on this a whole whole lot well thank you um so the chapter ends with the two of them going to look at peter in the nursery um and, and i know we've called um a, a lot of characters christ figures over the course of the show matt i think we've done it 47 times um it's kind of our thing but has there ever been a more clear christ figure than peter here a child born less than two weeks after christmas who is basically symbolizing and representing hope and and the resurrection of humanity right it's it's just perfect it's just perfect Mm -hmm. um and also i i will say that he's named peter after franny's father but also peter was one of uh the apostles of christ and and was largely considered you know one of the original founders of the church itself uh i think peter is called like the first pope 
technically. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if that like I think that's more of a you know not revisionist history thing, but like we retroactively called him the first pope. But I think you know Peter in is a very a very meaningful name to give this this particular child as well. Yeah, no, that's great. I I think you're I think you're right. I, I definitely um, think there is some sort of gesturing at the idea that. You know, I think like we said a minute ago, the reason it's important that Stu comes back is to be the father of of Peter and that Peter is is the symbol of this new, you know, age on the earth of of the uh people living rightly, you know, in nature yeah. the way God intended or whatever. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, so we move on to chapter 78. We jump forward from January to May, and we learn that things in the zone are going pretty well. There's there's tons of people mad here, thousands, thousands of people. Uh, we also learn that Stu had to get his leg rebroken and reset, and now it's it's all better. It's all better. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> I, lo- no, I actually like when the, doc- when the doctor's like, you, still- you got a limp, huh? That didn- didn't heal right. Come by my office. And Stu's like, I, I don't know. It's come by my office. Yeah, and then uh, and then Franny gives him the the I want line uh, <laughs> on her for forehead, which is great. <laughs> the I want line is the greatest uh, uh, literary device ever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but Matt, uh, we learn here that it's almost as if the the free zone is getting too big because Franny pulls Stu aside and and tells him that. She wants to leave. She wants to go home. She wants to go back to Maine. She doesn't belong here. She belongs back at home. Um, we learn that Stu, who doesn't really feel any desire to go back to his home, also does feel uh, an itch to leave. Um, that th- 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 There's this idea that things are starting to start up again here. Um, mm-hmm. Things are starting to go back to normal. Normal being, you know, a, a pre, pre-pandemic normal, not a... a, a you know, normal for the free zone, but normal for, for normal. Um, I think, I think one, one of the things Stu says is here, um, if Glenn had been here, Stu thought he would have said that the endless American struggle between the law and freedom of the individual had begun again. Um, so there's this real feeling that like, Oh, we're, we're settling into normalcy into American normalcy again. Uh huh. Yeah, I mean, what? So I'll just be honest with you. In this exact moment, while reading, I I was like, oh my god, they're they're insane to to want to go off <laughs> away from civilization and just live like in the ruins of the dead world. I, you know, the more I thought about it, the more I like. I, I've also, I, I think, like every red blooded human being, I have sometimes fantasized about just you know homesteading off in the Alaskan wilderness. And the, the thing is, though, like I always come back to my senses and r- realize that I'm romanticizing something that would be incredibly hard uh and unpleasant um so i guess i guess you could say i'm of two minds about this but i think the story is definitely saying you you should go back to your roots living living in in, you know with with families um uh not living in these cities with electricity and everything that's not the way that's not what you're supposed to be doing yeah i mean or or at least not yet right like i mean Mm -hmm. there, there was this thing we talked about many times throughout the course of the book that that what is happening in this book is almost unnatural that the the gathering of people as quickly as they are gathering uh in vegas and boulder is not how things would go naturally right like in a post-pandemic world people would eventually you know congregate but not in the levels that they're happening here and that's because you know they're they're driven by you know the the two sides and the power of the two sides calling them and driving them forward. Mm-hmm. And so once that, you know, once that final stand has happened, once that battle has finished, you know, there's, there's no reason actually that they need to stay in this one community that all, that all surviving people on the side of good need to all congregate in this one place. Um, yeah. And I mean, I agree with you, like the idea of, of, you know, going out into the wilderness has its own, its own attraction and also its own fear. I, I really liked, I liked how Franny put it. Like there are books. We can both read them. We can't live our lives afraid. Can we mm-hmm. like, and also the idea of like books and good drugs, we can learn to use them. And for the drugs that have gone over, we can learn to make them again. You know, this is, this is not, you know, just picking up the pieces of, of the old world and, and employing them. This is, you know, the desire here is actually to learn how to live again, to learn how to make things again and not just recycle 
the things, but to learn. Like, you know, this is one thing I think we talked about at the very beginning of the book, this idea that most people that exist in this world don't know how any of this shit works. Like mm-hmm. any of the infrastructure that that keeps our stuff running, we don't know how that works. And if that stuff's going to break down, we don't know how to fix it. Um, we yeah. I don't know how to I don't know how to make drugs. <laughs> I don't know right. how to, like I don't I don't I don't know how to farm. I don't know how to do any of these things, right? And these are yeah. things that you know, like the world that has been constructed, this world of things on the floor ready to be picked up, means that that in these these communities, people probably wouldn't have to learn how to do all these things for a very very long time. That you know, as long as we have the resources left by the millions of people that killed over and, and died for the foreseeable future, it's not something that that humanity is really going to have to learn. Um, and, and perhaps one of the things the book is saying is that that's not not ideal. Actually, we sh- we mm-hmm. should we should learn we should know these things. We should know how to do them. Yeah, I, I think it is. I mean, I I, I actually think that king might be making a sort of overt political claim that human beings should not live in in large congregations at all um Mm -hmm. and the reason i say that is there's several places throughout the book where where he basically points at the idea of like well what if there's a settlement over here and a settlement over there and then they you know they they realize that you know they might ultimately be fighting over natural resources and so one of them tries to take the other one out like that's the whole premise in a sense mm-hmm. um you know glenn mentions it super early in the story then it turns out to be the actual plot of the story and then <laughs> and, and then at the very end of the story you know they sort of mention it again and it's like well what if we just all lived far from each other in little homesteads i i feel like that's something that king is at least um kind of you know to use the word again romanticizing yeah. um or, or making seem like a more appealing way of living in this book sure sure I don't know. <clears throat> and so we jump forward in time again with Stu and Franny sitting on the porch of Mother Abigail's Nebraska home, watching young Peter play in the dirt. Stu is once again thinking about the free zone, noting that they weren't the only ones with the itch to leave and go out and search for for life on their own. And uh, and Stu thinks, you know, to reiterate what we've been saying here, that maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it's a good thing that the Boulder free zone kind of just collapses. Yeah. Um people might actually learn to give up on the old ways naturally. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think if you think about the King cosmos this way, then the end of the world was sort of the only way to cleanse humanity of its own self-destructive nature and give it a second chance. Um, and, you know, the risk is as, as the Lud, the Luddites, the people who lived in Lud, mm-hmm. um, they, they persisted in the old ways amongst the ruins of the old cities. And after their own apocalypse, they were still, awful and they kind of degenerated into being orcs more or less um so everyone sort of abandoning boulder i, I would see as positive like it's it, it would be like the the the, the proto luddites abandoning lud and, and living in the wilderness and maybe f- pulling together some scraps of of dignity again yeah yeah i really like i really like this too one of the things we're, we're shown here is that um the last meeting that Stu was a part of before they left the Boulder free zone, the current, you know, head of the police force was asking the committee for permission to arm his deputies. He said that, you know, a a drunk man attacked one of his deputies. And if he had a gun, he would have been able to stop that man from doing it. And, uh, and so that's, that's a scary thought. And and what, what Stu thinks here is what happens after you give guns to the deputies? He asked himself, what's the logical progression? And it seemed that it was the scholarly, slightly dry voice of Glenn Bateman that spoke the answer. You give them bigger guns and police cars. And when you discover a free zone community down in Chile or maybe up in Canada, you make a Hugh Petrella, you make Hugh Petrella the minister of defense just in case. Maybe you start to send out search parties because after all, that stuff is lying around just waiting to be picked up. Mm -hmm. Um, It's kind of like it's it leaves you disturbed about the free zone right like this idea yeah. that we've already got to the points where our cops need guns again um mm-hmm. that's scary a little bit that that's how quickly it's going how quickly it's going back yeah and this just feels like a great callback it's a callback to their original conversation with glenn and it's also just yeah uh it, it it's it's funny because we compared the free zone to america right and and king definitely has his mixed feelings about america and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and so the idea that the free zone might slide into that is uh central to what he's doing with the story yeah and i i think that like it's very easy and i i 
actually found myself doing this, it's very easy to forget that a great majority of this book, a, a, a vast majority of this book, hundreds of pages, is devoted to people sitting in Boulder trying to figure out how to how to build society, right? Um, and they were struggling with it. They were struggling what the right things are to do, you know. And this this struggle that they have is interrupted by the conflict of the novel by mm-hmm. the dark man and everything he's doing and the, the final stand that needs to happen. And so at the end of this, we're left with kind of picking up the pieces of that whole thing again. And it's interesting that our characters that were so integrated in that are either dead or in Stu's case and, and Franny's case, no longer interested in actually being part of part of that particular community that their, their, their choice at the end of this is how do you build society after this? You, you go out and build it. You don't congregate. You don't do this thing. You don't, try to repeat the the mistakes of the past. I, I think this is, you know, why the why the denouement is so important here because King is acknowledging that I spent a lot of pages talking about society. I need I need to wrap this part up mm-hmm. and I need to make this part clear that it's not just about defeating evil. It's about what is what does the world look like? If you had a chance to rebuild the world tomorrow, how would you do it? What would you do? Yeah. What is right and what is wrong? How do you are we doomed to repeat the mistakes of the past? Are, are we always going to do that? Is it, as the book says, a, a circle, um, mm-hmm. a wheel, or, yeah. or not? I mean, I think you're absolutely right with all of that. The feeling that the ending of the book gives me with is that, that there is this tension, there's this worry, but part of that is hope. We have a hope that, well, maybe yeah. this time it won't go that way. Maybe this mm-hmm. time the the people of the Boulder Free Zone will indeed disperse Go go back to their roots, um, not uh, you, you know l- live according to precepts that are actually you know humanist and and not uh, rationalist in, in flags mm-hmm. usage, mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and everything could be different. And we're not saying it's going to be different. We're not saying it's necessarily everyone's doomed to to repeat the past again. But there's hope, and that it, that's it, yeah. It is very similar to the ending of the Dark Tower in that right mm-hmm. then. That obviously, you know, there, there's there's it, it's less direct than the Dark Tower, um, you know, of of just resuming the quest right where we began it all. Like that's that's very direct. But it, it, the idea that at at the back of this, you know, it seems like things could repeat themselves, but but there is hope. You're right. Um, like I, mm-hmm. I love I love what what Stu thinks when he looks down at Peter. Looking down at Peter, he thought maybe if we tell him what happened, he'll tell his own children. Warn them. Dear children, the toys are death. They're flash burns and radiation sickness and black choking plague. These toys are dangerous. The devil in men's brains guided the hands of God when they were made. Don't play with these toys, dear children. Please, not ever, not ever again. Please, please learn the lesson. Let this empty world be your copybook. Um, I, I, I don't know. I find that wonderful. Um, the, the sentence that I'm most intrigued by is, these toys are dangerous. The devil in men's brains guided the hands of God when they were made. Yeah. <laughs> That's quite a sentence, isn't it? <laughs> mm-hmm. Like it almost, it almost puts the evil of the world. I, that's not God. That's our nature actually. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I like that. Really interesting to think about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh, this idea, this, uh, this, this idea, like, you know, men is the creation of God, right? It, mm-hmm. We are the hand. The, what what is the hands of God? You know, the hand of God was a very distinct image in this book. Like right? the the hand of God is what appeared over Vegas and and executed the bomb. But 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 the hands of God are people, <laughs> right? Like the the if the hands are the the tool to get the job done that you you want to get done. Well, clearly the hands of God is, is, is man, is mm. mankind, is people, um, because mm. pe- people ultimately uh, do what God wants people to do. You know, like he, he, people are his instruments to work what he wants. And so like at this sentence, the devil in men's brains guided the hands of God when they were made. So these are the, these are the, uh, we, we are the instruments that were meant to do great, wonderful things in this world. 
and mm-hmm. this is what we did instead we were cre- you know yeah the devil the devil in men's brains um not yeah. the de- not the devil right not the devil not evil the devil in men's brains right like this is yeah. distinct and separate like it could have said you know guided by the devil men created men took the gift of god and made something terrible but no the devil in in men's brains the evil that lives inside of all of us took this great gift this great power this great ability and made something terrible and horrible with it yeah right i mean that's that's in a lot of theology is the idea that that humankind was given free will and this was a sort of a sort of gift and curse because it allows us to have the self-determination and and de- depending on what theology you're talking about exactly it's like no like you really actually have th- free will like you are not fated to do any particular thing just because God has a plan. Um, but that also means you can choose evil. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, I don't know. I, I find that to be just an incredibly poetic evocation of the idea that the devil in men's brains. Yeah, it's great. Me too. I love it. I love it so much. Um, so the, the book proper ends on this line. Do you think? Do you think people ever learn anything? She opened her mouth to speak, hesitated, fell silent. The kerosene lamp flickered. Her eyes seemed very blue. I don't know, she said at last. She seemed unpleased with her answer. She struggled to say something more, to illuminate her first response. I could only say it again. I don't know. Um, I, I like What I love here is... King doesn't come to a conclusion on this, right? Mm-hmm. Like the the idea, like are are we gonna get better? Are we gonna overcome our worst nature? I, I hope so. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't know. I, like yeah. to have to have a definitive answer there just feels wrong. Yeah. But I I leave this feeling optimistic, which is I think what King wants us to do. Yeah. Yeah, I leave it feeling optimistic. I mean, there there's one thing I think about as I as I proceed into my dotage, that's how you say that word, right? The word meaning extreme old age is, um, <laughs> is, is that like, I feel like I have actually accrued what you could call wisdom. You know, there's this thing that happens as, as you get older, where you begin to realize that all of these banal aphorisms are actually deep statements of wisdom. And you're like, Oh my God, I, if only I'd understood this when I was younger. And it's like, yeah, you heard it when you were younger and you thought it sounded banal because you didn't, have the life experience to contextualize it and this has been happening for 10,000 years we we try to pass on the lessons of wisdom from from our our lives to our children and they're just like whatever old man um and i, I mentioned that because it's like do people ever learn and it's like kind of but it's so slow <laughs> and 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 it's kind of two steps forward one step back um at least that's my perspective on it yeah no i agree with you Definitely. <clears throat> All right. Um, so that is the end of the book proper. And uh, unless you had anything more you wanted to say about this before we move into yeah, the epilogue. Let's, let's move on. All right. So the epilogue, which we will mention here, I think we mentioned it at the top, but again, that this was not part of the original release. This was added to the 1990 release of the book. So we did not get to see Randall Flagg again. But here in the epilogue, Randall Flagg wakes up on a beach on an island with no memories of how we got here. But as the native people of that island approach him, his memories start to come back and he immediately lusts for power once again. And he says to them, my name is Russell Faraday. I have a mission. They stare at, stared at him, all eyes, all dismay, all fascination. I have come to help you. They began to drop on their knees and bow their heads before him. And as a dark shadow fell amongst them, his grin widened. I've come to teach you how to be civilized. Yana, the chief sobbed in joy and terror, and as he kissed Russell Faraday's feet, the dark man began to laugh. He laughed and laughed and laughed. Life was such a wheel that no man could stand upon for long, and it always, at the end, came round to the same place again. Uh, so, well, okay, so that's this a bit is, more pessimistic. <laughs> yeah, so th- this is the question I have for you. Like, I, I think you're absolutely right that we leave the the story proper with this real feeling of hope and optimism that, that yes, you know, humanity sucks at times and we struggle and we fail and we end up being the tools of our own destruction. It, it seems like, 
but there's hope. There's hope mm-hmm. that this time we can learn. There's hope that this time we can change. Uh, and we don't know if it's for sure. And it's going to take work and it's going to take people standing vigilant. But there's hope. And then we get this epilogue that, again, was added. And the epilogue seems to say, yeah, but don't forget, there's evil still. And 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 I, I think it's important that this these final two lines are not necessarily a declarative statement of the book, right? Life was such a wheel that no man could stand upon it for long. And it always at the end came round to the same place again. This is from flags perspective. This is flags belief, right? This is flags saying this. Um, And so I I don't think we can say that that's the book declaring the statement that, Oh no, we're just going to come back to where we were again. Definitively. Yeah. I agree that this is, um, this is flags twisted perspective his his fatalistic perspective that mm-hmm. that he he will always you know he will always it's interesting because it's not that he'll always win it's just that he'll always have his day even yeah. if even if he loses um and uh yeah i it is interesting i i, I didn't actually notice the the motif of cycles being present in both this and the dark tower but i i do like do like that pick that's really good mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess so overall, do you think it hurts the message and the feeling you had coming out of the actual novel, uh, the book itself outside of the epilogue? Does this does this hurt it or does this enhance it? Do you, do you like this epilogue? What's your what's your feeling? Well, it feels of a piece with the whole idea that the evil never dies. It, it has to be stood up to again and again and again. Mm-hmm. Uh, it never has a final victory or a final defeat. Um, I think that's actually the optimistic side is it never has a final victory. Yeah, it does. It does. You, you never, you're never done with it, but, um, you always have a chance. I think that's, that's the optimism. Um, that's the optimism. And as, as for like, how do I feel about it in general? I mean, so, so this was, this was cut from the original release, right? right? Yep. I, I don't know that I feel like this adds to the book. I kind of feel like I would have been a little bit, you know, like, like the way a thing ends really influences how you feel about it. Mm-hmm. And I feel like I would feel marginally better overall, just like about the book as a, as a work, if it had just ended with Franny saying, I don't know, because then it leaves you with kind of a tension, kind of a, an optimism, but sure. attention in that optimism. And this is, you know, this is not that. Yeah, no, I, I think I agree with you on that. I mean, there's parts of it I, I do really like. I, I love I love the idea of I've come to teach you how to be civilized. Mm-hmm. Um, I think this is really important, you know, to like flag has been seen as, you know, quintessentially American. That's like what the book has said about him. And this idea that he's going to find this, this uncivilized group of natives. And the first thing he's going to say is I've come to teach you how to be civilized. I think is like the, 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 one of the original sins of America, this idea that, you know, we come to a new place and say, Oh, look, there's people here time to civilize you. Right. Like it, it, it's this perfect kind of last connecting tissue of, of the image of Randall flag as, as America incarnate or the, the worst, the worst tendencies of America incarnate. Mm-hmm. Um, so I appreciate the kind of closing of that particular loop. Um, but I, I think I agree with you generally that uh, I would have enjoyed the I would have had much more emotional I don't even know if satisfaction is the right word but like resonance if the last thing of this book that I read was I don't know yeah I don't know because uh, it leaves it re- kind of reminds me of what Frank Herbert said about the way he chose to end Dune where he he ends the book in sort of what feels like mid paragraph um I mean it isn't mid paragraph because it's that is where the paragraph ends right Mm -hmm. but it feels it feels like you took a step and then there wasn't a stare there narratively you know pacing wise or or even just the tempo of of the scene Mm -hmm. and and then that leaves you walking you you put down the book and it's still alive in your head um and and that ending the book with i don't know it is a perfect thing to keep it alive in your head because you're like, well, what do I think about that? And then you walk away and you, you keep thinking, you're like, do people ever learn? Well, yeah. Know, it, it, and and then having to move on from that into more stuff is, yeah. is just kind of truncates your ability to do that. Yeah. And I think from a purely practical perspective too, I I think there's enough 
bits and pieces throughout these last few chapters of uh, Randall Flagg's not really gone. He'll never be really gone. He'll always be there. Evil will always be there. You know, he's in the wolves mm-hmm. and the creature. Like there's so many beats of this again and again and again throughout those chapters that I don't think we need to literally see Randall Flagg to get the idea that evil is eternal and it, it, it never truly goes away. You know, like I think I think we've understood that concept broadly without the specificity of I am Russell Faraday. I am Randall Flagg. I am back and I yeah. am, am wreaking my mischief once again. Like I think I think the message is gotten without that bit. Yeah. I, I agree. Yep, I agree totally. It's um you know, the the on, the only thing that I wanted to comment on was the Faraday name and the fact that I thought that the Lost reference to Faraday was just because they use a bunch of philosopher and scientist names in Lost, but now I realize <laughs> it's it's another to the stand reference. Oh, hey Matt, um, uh-huh. you want to do that uh, Lost podcast? Yeah, but, 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 but. Just think of how much we could talk about Daniel Faraday and if he's a good character or not, and is he mm. a tragic character? Have you thought? He's, no spoilers for Lost. Have you thought about how freaking tragic Daniel Faraday's life is that, recently? That's one of the things that made me mad at Lost as a show is that specific character and what they do with him where I'm just like, oh my God, <laughs> this is so mean. Yeah, but that's um, storytelling, man. It's, you know, I don't know, man. I think I just have a certain aesthetic sense of like, there's there's a level of mean past which I'm like, why did I sign up? I I, if you had told me in advance that you were going to do this to me, I just wouldn't have. I wouldn't have done this. I wouldn't have gotten on the ride. I don't know. I don't know, man. Matt, you got to get on all the rides. The I, scary and the sad rides are just as good as the fun rides. I'd, you know, Scott, I'd rather just rather just be a pulsating bliss orb. <laughs> no, we we talked about this. You, that's bad. That's bad. No, reject right. the bliss no. orb lost no, podcast 2023 no. let's go <laughs> reject the bliss orb therefore <laughs> must do a lost the lost podcast uh, <laughs> interesting interesting rhetorical technique there you know what's Scott? i'll continue to think about it okay that's all i ever wanted Matt. Uh-huh. okay will we do a lost podcast i don't know i don't know i don't know <laughs> all right that's gonna do it for the stand oh my goodness we finished the book matt there we go yeah wow. we did it. i can't believe it that only uh, took like three years right yeah, yeah. give or take yeah. all right <laughs> matt uh let's move on to the discussion question section of the show it's part where of course we answer or you answer rather our our wonderful discussion question from last week with your wonderful answers so matt what was last week's discussion question the question was who's your favorite character in the stand that's you know one. yeah there's yeah. always a fear with these questions matt that you're going to ask a question like this and everyone mentions the same person mm-hmm. and then you're like oh bummer this was a bad question actually but that didn't happen good Good. Yeah, I, I think it's it's usually a good question to ask at the at the end of a thing. Um and yeah, let's let's go into it. So All right. uh Karina twenty twenty says, Talk about a loaded question. The stand has to be top five Stephen King for me, and I love so many of the characters, but I think my favorite is Stu. Now Karina's gonna be really mad at me then. Um, <laughs> he goes through so much from the beginning at the gas station to being locked up at the research center and breaking free to becoming a leader in Boulder and finding Franny, who is another character that I love. I imagine his Texas accent, the slow drawl with, with uh, which I have, which I have too with my Southern accent, and I relate to some of the slower Southern sensibilities he has. He is super thoughtful about how he goes about things, which serves him well. The close second is Nick and Tom. I have read this so much; I feel like I know these characters so well. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't dissing, I wasn't dissing Stu. You understand? I just, no. I just, I just like the other two guys more. I, I think Stu's a great character. Karina's already stopped listening to yeah. our show because oh, you, you made them, yeah, an it's, enemy of it, us forever. It's, Good it's job, Matt. Yeah. Oh, oh well. <laughs> Next, we have Baby Can You Dig Your Sam, uh, who says, well, given my Reddit handle, if you've guessed La- it's Larry Underwood, then you are correct. I've always loved Larry, and I've got a soft place in my heart for reformed bad boys, and he fits nicely into that. Larry's just so damned human. The best and worst parts of him are equally explored, and it's fun to watch him learn and grow and become more of the Larry that he always could be, which is a stark contrast to Harold Louder. 
Adam Stork was dreamy as Larry in the 1994 stand adaptation, which only made me love him more. One of the oh so many disappointing things from the 2020 series is that they really made Larry as uninteresting as possible. And how do you cut the effing Lincoln Tunnel sequence? Wow. That's a spoilers, Matt, for our, our conversation about that show in a few weeks. But yes, they cut the Lincoln Tunnel sequence, Matt. That's ridiculous. I agree. I'm, I'm angry now. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, and I, I'd love, I think Larry, just for the record, I think Larry might be my favorite character as well. See, now you're spoiling things we're going to talk about on the show next week, Matt. Okay. So great. That's well, great. I, you know, maybe I'll change my mind by next week. Maybe All I'll right. just uh, edit this part out and I'll never know. Yeah, okay. Uh, walking dude 22 <laughs> says, well, I have to mention that there is a walking dude in this story. Randall flag is always so much fun, but this is his story. This is, uh, this is only one of two times flag is the central figure of the random. But although I admire this hard cases means of transportation, I don't really think he's my favorite. I, I sort of relate to, sorry. I sort of relate the most to Larry because I ain't no nice guy. I have my own struggles with self-destruction and self-righteousness. Although my favorite Larry moment doesn't happen in, in the book, but does happen in the original miniseries. Um, there's spoilers, I guess they say. But he's, sing, he's singing a song it while matter. there's a fire burning behind him. I mean, it's a specific moment that I don't, I'm not familiar with. Yeah, but um, it's not spoiler. I don't know. You can't yeah. be spoiled on a miniseries when you have read the book it's based on i don't think yeah i don't know man. Uh, th they also give an honorable mention to um ray flowers the uh um sorry there, there's it, this is the guy who who is manning his talk radio program um even until the fascist military dudes smash into his his booth and, and kill him um I agree. You know, that happened so long ago that I forgot about that part of the book, but I, I found that to be <laughs> some of the most powerful stuff in the whole book actually was, was like the military massacring people. Yeah, I agree. Next we have XX sweet misery. who says started listening during the pandemic and now I'm following along real time. Well, welcome. The stand is my hands down favorite book of all time. And for the first time I felt the need to come here and answer a discussion question. I read the stand for the first time when I was 15 and without a doubt, my favorite character was Franny. She became my BFF through that read. I loved how strong and forceful she was, even as a teenager finding her way through a difficult world and making her own choices be damned what anyone else thought. Fast forward to 51 years old me reading the book, and Dana is not, not only my favorite character in this book, but in any book. I love how she just loves her life lives her life and then whenever she needs to she stands tall and takes no shit from the first time we meet her escaping her captors and giving them what they deserve to making her way to las vegas and winding her way into lloyd's bed in order to get info to protect her people to her very last act of basically telling flag fuck you you will get nothing from me her character makes me think of saying throw me to the wolves and i will come back leading the pack even though i love her i wasn't sad at her death i was invigorated and thought hell yeah dana you're standing tall you stand and tell them how it is, my girl. Uh, wonderful answer. I love Dana Jurgens as well. She's much, much smaller character than some of our big ones, but uh, I think she gets a lot of characterization, actually. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Um, it, that's that's one thing where it, I think characters like Dana might stand out more on the second read because you know where they're headed. And, and so I will notice Dana when she's introduced, whereas I, if I recall correctly, when she was introduced, I kind of lost track of her in, in a bunch of other characters. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. But yeah, no, I love it. Love, love Dana. She, this, yeah, her her final scene is amazing. Steve Living Room says, "I also like Stu the best." Oh uh -oh. no, <laughs> he's the he's the first main character we meet, and his calm, cool, level headedness never wavered once, from turning off the gas pumps to surviving both hospitals and killing all and killing in the process, to how he handled Harold and fell in love with Franny. He always stayed true to himself. My favorite line of his is when he first meets Harold and Franny and thinks to himself, Harold is in for a big shock when he finds he doesn't own Franny or something like that. Just a great perspective throughout the book. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You know, like, here's the thing. The reason why I, the reason why I like the others more than I like Stu is that he is, like, great. He's, like, he's, like, just great. Mm -hmm. And, and I like characters who are, who are horribly flawed. <laughs> 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 and, and and Stu is not horribly flawed um, yeah I mean great. I've kind of been keeping my mouth shut about your your relentless Stu hate uh -huh. but yeah, um, right. I, I do generally ag 
agree with you, uh, th- at least in the fact that like when compared to some of the other characters in the novel, I find him a little bit lacking. Um, I, I think actually m- maybe we'll talk more about this next week, but I think this is very early King protagonist problem. Like he reminds me a lot of, of um, um, oh, who's the Salem's lot guy. Uh, ben Mears. Ben Mears. Yes. He reminds me a lot of Ben Mears and the, the complaints we had about Ben Mears and Salem's lot. But I, I think it's it's not because he's not a great, great dude, right? It's actually, it's it's the opposite. It's that I wish he wasn't such a great dude. So like from a question of like, who do you like the most? Yeah, Stu's fucking awesome. I love him. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I'm not, that, that's, it, it's funny when, when I, I'll, I'll, uh, seriously, all I mean is I like the others more. It's not that I dislike Stu. Yes. Yeah. 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 I think, I think, I think everyone gets it now. Yes. I hope so. Or else they're going to hate you forever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Random Nitty 513 says, I first read The Stand when I was 13, and my favorite character has always been Nick Andros, a young man who has dealt a really rough hand, but who has the fortitude and determination to be a good person, regardless of how, how many times he's been kicked while down, literally. Also, I have to say that as a young, horny teen without many friends and a love of writing, I always understood Harold, but instinctively knew he was a cautionary tale of the condescending and off putting troll I might become if I wasn't careful. Well, I agree part- on, on Nick and and <laughs> I also agree on the cautionary tale of Harold. Part of me really hopes that somebody would do a discussion question answer that was just Harold and they and, and just write the answer in such a way that it that that they clearly think Harold is the hero of the story and he's tragic <laughs> for you. Um That'd be great. Yeah. Um yeah, that's that's a good answer. All right, uh Adaraxieri says it's got to be Franny for me. The first read, uh, I'm sorry, I, my eyes are not working. I first read The Stand in sixth grade, and even way back then, I just felt such kinship with this woman who had a troubled relationship with her mother, but is close to her father, who gets the giggles and occasionally lashes out while chiding herself internally. Honestly, I think she was the first female character I had encountered in a book who really felt like a real person to me, and not just a person, but someone I saw a lot of myself in. Later, when I caught pregnant as a teenager and had to tell my own furious mother, it just cemented the bond. Her treatment toward the end of the book as a sort of emotional landmine slash glorified incubator, I know, not completely fair, is disappointing. But it's also something I never really noticed until this read-through because I love her too much to be critical. It's also not really unrealistic, just a little sad. Honorable mention to Lloyd because his story about the forgotten rabbit is the single most memorable part of this book for me. It's so unbelievably horrifying. And as a person with ADHD who often entirely forgets something exists if it it is out of my sight, my heart goes out to him for that alone. So much rabbit stuff in this book, actually. (laughs) (laughs) Can't believe believe Lloyd just left Bigwig in the cage to die. I'm sure Hazel tried to get him out but couldn't. (laughs) Uh, That's a great answer. I I love Franny. I want to actually kind of save, because I I have a lot of things I want to say about Franny along the line of of what the uh, question answer here talked about but i want to save that till next week because I, I think i think we could have a really long detailed discussion about the parts of franny that i think work really wonderfully and then the ways in which i think the book kind of lets her down at at the end of it a little bit but i want to save that for our overview conversation so yeah sounds good to, yeah to, that be, it, to be concluded it's cool to see all these different franny answers though yeah definitely um just stand 8460 says it's stew for me <laughs> he just represents a good dude who may have grown up at a certain time and place making him prone to have a certain perspective but he always strikes me as someone who doesn't judge he is open to learning and will do the right thing and back the right horse even if it's a new realization i think his time in the war plus some tragedy not to mention a pandemic and the prospect of human extinction has given him a measure of suffering that endears us to him but also gives him a healthy realism about the world and the people in it it also makes him more appreciative for what he has also i like gary sinise's performance it felt pretty on the mark cool we will find out if you agree about gary sinise in a couple weeks matt gary sinise at stew Uh uh-huh never in a million years (laughs) would i have done that but that's a fascinating yeah i guess i'll see huh wow all right uh, Chandrath says, I read The Stand when I was 14 or 15. Now I'm 31, so my memories of the characters and my reac- reactions as I read the book are dim, to say the least. Instead, I'm, gonna, I'm going on the characters who I still remember even now. 
And so I must have enjoyed in some way. And that's Glenn and Nick. Nick Andros, even through all his struggles, never loses his will, his steel, or his goodness. He's a gunslinger on every level of the tower where that's possible, and the next big thing when it isn't. And Glenn, I just like the grumpy old man with a heart of gold as a character archetype. I admit that a lot of what he said would have gone straight over my head when I read the book, but I'm sure it was very clever. <laughs> yes, Glenn. Very, very clever, Glenn. You're, I'm sure you were very clever. You know, I, I, you know, I like Glenn a lot too me too i think larry mm-hmm. and glenn are my are, are my are my two favorites that i'll that I'll, I'll have to think about over the next week um yeah no it's i i actually totally think that judging based on how how much characters stick with you is a totally viable way of of thinking about like what what your favorites are because like there's got to be something really powerful there if, if it's going to stand out after all those years oh 100 percent, totally agree uh, last, but certainly not least, we have Sigma, who says the one and only big dick Nick Andrews. <laughs> when I first read him, I immediately fell in love just based off his kindness and struggle. I'll admit I've been gay for him for years. I felt so hard for him that I got mad whenever a chapter focused on someone else took me. So took uh, whenever a chapter focused on someone else. So it took me a while to care about Franny and Stu and the others, especially Larry. He's definitely the most protagonistic of the cast, which is pretty refreshing after reading chapters with Harold and Larry. I do need to look into how accurately King writes his disabilities, but I remember thinking I've never actually thought about what it would like to be deaf and mute on my first go around. I cried reading his backstory and when he had to take care of the prisoners, Nick Antros, my beloved, he truly never spoke nor heard no evil. That's clever. I was astounded by just how interior the writing gets with him, and I'm impressed four years later as a very different person. If there was ever an angel, it was him. Morally upstanding, like Jonathan Joe Starr, while also being intriguing and complex. Usually characters like that are rather flat, but not him. His relationship with Tom only made him better. I love Nick Andros. Yep. Matt, do you love Nick Andros? I love Nick Andros. I actually actually think that's a great uh, explanation of what there is to love about Nick Andros. Like I agree. Just all all, kind of hit all of the main points that I like about this character. Yeah, me too. Great answer. Uh, Great answer. Everyone. I think this was really cool. Thank you so much for every, for sharing for those of you that uh, we read. And and of course those that, that we didn't get to read on the show this week, but uh, all your answers were great. Yeah. Really appreciate everybody's contributions and and the thought you put into them. Absolutely. And we're going to need more of your contributions folks, because next week is our overview episode. If you're new to this podcast, when we finish the book, we always do one final episode where we look at the book as a whole. And never has that been more necessary than it has been right now because we've been at this book for 15 weeks and we've been so close to the trees. We haven't really talked about the forest very much. And so I'm I'm looking forward to spending one last week really looking at this massive book as one big thing. Uh, So that's what we're going to be doing next week. And as part of that, we always do a mailbag, which is basically instead of us asking you questions, you're going to ask us some questions. It's been it's been four whole months since we did one of these. So I'm assuming everyone has a bunch of questions, right? Right, Matt? That's probably true, right? Just a backlog of them that you've just been storing in a text document somewhere. (laughs) Uh, You can, of course, ask us questions about The Stand, about Stephen King, um, about any of the other books we've covered about The Dark Tower or any of that stuff. Or you can ask us whatever questions you want. It's an open mailbag. Whatever you want to ask us, we will try to answer it to the best of our ability. Uh, So that's what's going to be next week on the show. We will look back at The Stand and then we will answer some of your questions. And uh, also, we're going to have a special announcement next week. So make sure you don't miss it because it's kind of a kind of a big deal, right? I like special announcements. I don't even, Matt. Do you even know what the special announcement is? I don't know if I've told you. I, I don't know. <laughs> you don't know if you don't know. I don't know if I know or not. That's a good sign. I might know. You might not. I don't know. The point is, you should come back and listen next week for all that fun stuff because that's what we're doing on our our final episode covering the novel The Stand. All right. Um, I, I can't wait to find out whether I know what you're talking about or not. <laughs> Remember, you can reach us via email at kingslingerspod at gmail.com or over on Twitter at kingslingerspod. And of course, the uh, the thread for this episode on r slash doof media on the subreddit is a great place to send us those mailbag questions that you want to ask us this time around. 
yes, please, please, please do. And please subscribe to Kingslingers if you are not already doing so. Um, there's still a few episodes left and uh, you don't want to miss any of them. So subscribe and uh, uh, do all do all the things. Make sure, hey, subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't yet. So you, you don't miss the Watership Down episode. Yeah, I'm super looking forward to that. And, you know, just in case you're like, huh, oh, that's a kid's book. It is maybe it is one of my favorite books now. Um, I had never read it before, but I, it, it, I love it. I love I love it. It is absolutely a kid's book in that the original <laughs> story was Richard Adams telling a story to his children. Uh-huh. But it's not like I don't know. It's not like YA. Like, you know, no. it's I, I, I see it as a as just a work of literature Mm -hmm. that the subject matter is something that you can imagine a child enjoying, but it's not. And, and and the tone that it strikes is something that a child would enjoy, but it's not, that doesn't make it any less enjoyable for adults. Totally agree. So if you haven't read Watership Down yet, uh, you've got two days to do it. (laughs) And then you can join us uh, Um, on Friday night. Over on our YouTube channel, which you subscribe, which you which you should go subscribe to right now. Mm-hmm. That's right. Um, and if you like uh, the Kingslingers podcast, then please consider donating to our Patreon at patreon.com slash doofmedia. Special thanks to new patron this week, Ginger. Uh, welcome. We hope you enjoy the cool stuff we have over there, including our uh, monthly bonus podcast on Stephen King's adaptations. Yeah, um, and if you cannot afford to donate, that is absolutely okay. There are still tons of ways to support us. Sharing the podcast is one of those ways. And of course, uh, leaving us ratings and reviews is still and always will be a great way to help support us. This week's spotlight review comes from Love These Birds, who gives us five stars and says, Thank you, Sai. Longtime constant reader, new to the path of the beam. No one I know shares my love for King's work, so finding this podcast must be Ka. You guys do such an amazing deep dive into the tower. I'm enjoying your takes, opinions, insights immensely. Keep up the excellent work. Well, thank you so much, Love These Birds. We really appreciate that. And we will. We will keep it up. Yes. Thank you. That's great. And thank you for everyone else who has taken the time to send those in. Please keep them coming. They do uh, they do seriously help us, and we do appreciate them. And they make us feel good about ourselves, which is the most important thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, folks, we will see you right back here next week for the final episode covering Stephen King's The Stand. Long days and pleasant nights. And may you have twice the number. Mm-hmm.